Oh my God. Thanks for joining us here on 9 News Plus. I'm Chris Bianchi. Now you've probably heard about so-called long COVID, which often involves long-term complications, such as serious health issues that can uh, take place for months, sometimes even years after you initially got COVID. But there's maybe a bit of a glimmer of hope for those of you who may have long COVID or those of you who might know who have had long COVID in relation to taste and smell. And for a bit more on this, we're now joined by Nine News medical expert, Dr. Pyle Coley. Um, Dr. Coley, it seems that there's been maybe some breakthroughs in that department, right? There really have, Chris, and, and so long COVID. A lot of people say, oh, as soon as I got over COVID, do I have long COVID? It usually takes about four to six weeks after the infection has cleared if you still have persistent symptoms. And as you said, Chris, it can look different for different people, uh, but a lot of people are having that persistent loss of taste or smell. Uh, I know there's a firefighter who lost his sense of smell, and so it doesn't just impact your quality of life, it can impact what you do for a living mm. as well. So having hope for a treatment and that's what we're learning as we're sort of digging out from the fallout of the pandemic, so to speak. We're going to have to come up with new treatments, and this new treatment is very fascinating, uh, particularly for the loss of taste or smell, but it actually also works on other aspects of long COVID as well. And by the way, some of you may have seen there was a viral video of a woman uh, in, in America. This was in early April. Uh, a woman who had her first cup of coffee after taking this treatment. <laughs> Uh, so, Dr. Cole, you mentioned that there is a breakthrough in terms of that. Can you describe that for us? Yeah, so this is called a stellate ganglion block, which is a fancy way of saying that we have these nerve bundles at the base of our neck hmm. that are part of our nervous system. It's called the sympathetic nervous system, and it regulates a whole bunch of functions. Our heart rate, our blood pressure, it can also regulate hormones or chemicals that our body releases in response to stimuli. And we know for a fact, for reasons we don't quite understand, that COVID can actually affect the function of our nervous system in many yeah. different ways. And that's really how it causes for some people that fast heart rates or tachycardia, the shortness of breath, the fatigue, many of those other types of clinical features of COVID as well. What we learned with this treatment is that that sympathetic nervous system may also be involved in the loss of sense of taste or sense of smell, and then of course the recovery from it. So by, by blocking it using an anesthetic, an anesthetic is basically a medicine that sort of turns off your nerve function. So if you think about when you're having a surgery or a procedure, if you don't wanna feel pain, you inject an anesthetic and it mm. turns off the pain nerves, so to speak. So in this case, when you inject the anesthetic close to these ganglia, it can change the way the sympathetic nerves, which again regulate a whole host of body functions and hormones, behave. And by changing the way that those sympathetic nerves are behaving, you can actually also change the blood flow to the brain, and you can change the way that the nerves cause us to perceive things in an inappropriate fashion. Is that, uh, okay, I guess that is kind of exciting. Could I just say that initially when I hear that these sorts of things that really regulate a lot of your key functions, is there a bit of a I'm sure it's been tested out that there's no side effects from this, right? You know, we've been using it for patients with chronic pain for a okay. long time. Hmm. And, and, and obviously you don't want to block out all your nerves because that'll impair your body functions. But if you very targeted go in using ultrasound and other tools to target it just to specific ganglia, it is a reasonably safe and well-tolerated procedure. And for a lot of patients, such yeah. as those with refractory chronic pain, it actually works really well. So, you know, it's not something I'm overly concerned about in terms of the risk to the patient, but I am still trying to wrap my head around the mechanism by which it helps our sense of taste and our sense of smell. Because one thing we know about COVID, one of the ways in which it attacks our sense of smell is that it directly poisons the nerves. So it gets into the nerve cells and causes damage to those nerve cells. So now, is it the chronic inflammation left behind by long COVID? Is it permanent damage to those nerves? Is it changing the way the nerves are responding to their inputs? What is the way in which COVID has sort of left those nerves permanently damaged? That would help us to understand how to reverse it. And I think this is a step closer in that direction, just understanding the pathophysiology of that phenomena. I was to say, is that one of those big takeaways from this is that maybe they're not permanently damaged and maybe there is a way to alter course, right? Exactly, so it's sort of almost like hitting reset on your computer, mm. like a hard reset I was gonna say that on, your, <laughs> on the nerves of, of your you know, sympathetic nervous system, which may have been sort of left awry or running a little clunky, so to speak, because of the COVID infection. Now we know that inflammation is a part of this as well. That's what we're still trying to tease out is how much chronic inflammation plays a role in some of those long COVID symptoms. But the fact that patients have not only improvement in you know taste and smell, but this is also case study 
studies have been published on using this therapy for actually changing some of those other sympathetic nervous system functions like the fast heart rates, the shortness of breath, the fatigue. Even those respond to these stellate ganglion blocks. That really does sort of you know, make us lead to the hypothesis that perhaps they're somehow rewiring the nerves and kind of hitting a reset on the body. I was just say, uh, sounds like a lot of the initial takeaways have been helping those with less severe, I mean, not, not to, uh, to your point, not to mitigate um, or not talk down about the taste and smell loss, but the more serious functions are also perhaps coming back a bit more from this? Yes, very much so. And, and that's great news. And it's, yeah, it's not just therefore the, 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 you know, the quantity of our life, but even the quality of our life that we're learning how to sort of recover and improve after COVID-19. Now, what's interesting is that the, the different variants behave differently in terms of how they sort of poisoned or made our nerves clunky. Hmm. So there are variants that are higher risk for potentially long COVID, some of the earlier variants, particularly the Delta variant, and some of the later variants, because they have a milder initial illness, may not leave as much kind of long-term chronic inflammation as some of those earlier variants. The vaccination status of the person can affect whether or not hmm. they have a risk for long COVID. And then the use of Paxlovid, which is that antiviral that really suppresses viral inflammation. New data is emerging that tells us that that may also modulate the risk of long COVID after an infection. So I'm really encouraging most of my patients now to talk to their doctors about Paxlovid, not just if they're in that high risk group, but also some of the young ones, because I see plenty of young people in my office that have long COVID and are struggling. And so mm. if they're worried about long COVID based on their initial illness, they may want to be on Paxlovid. Um, I guess when it comes to long COVID as well, you mentioned a lot of your younger patients that you're seeing. Uh, my understanding, and again, this is purely anecdotal on my side, that a lot of people have uh, uh, exhaustion and just um, a bit more of a right a bit more foggy headed as well i think those are some of the symptoms i've heard is there any indication that this can help that specifically as well yes okay. and that's the other thing because we're really it's not just the exhaustion it's it's the exhaustion that leads to then the depression that mm. then leads to the slowing down which can then lead to the weight gain it's the foggy head which leads to performance at work which can then lead to lack of sleep, which can then, you know, so it's the dominoes all falling one after the other. And it's really, really hard because we as physicians are struggling with therapies. And sometimes I'm really left sort of shrugging my shoulders to my patients. Now, thankfully, some patients have done really well with uh, what we call cardiopulmonary rehabilitation, meaning graded exercise programs, those types of things to really help kind of get their body back in shape, retrain their nerves and their body as to how to exercise and how to feel better. Uh, certain antidepressants have worked in some patients but for some, as you said, the headaches, the brain fog, the fatigue, the sleep disturbances, you know, the shortness of breath, the tachycardia. I have a young woman who's a physician. When she stands up, her heart rates kind of shoot way up into mm. the 150s, and she used to be an athlete. So it makes it really difficult for her to exercise. So just so many different ways in which this has left its impact. And, and we don't yet know, but we have some theories that perhaps young people may even be struggling more with long COVID because their immune system is even more in shape. So when mm. it reacts to a virus like COVID, it can sort of overreact even more than kind of an older, you know, less in shape immune system, which might have a blunted response to the virus. Because we mm. think part of this is a virus itself and part of this is just the inflammatory response from our immune system that it leaves behind. I guess also, final thought uh, about this is that we're still really learning a lot about COVID and we're more than three years now into this being a global pandemic and yet it feels like every day every week there's new things coming up isn't there? Very much so and I also think it's not just one virus it is a whole family of viruses mm. because the variants kept changing I mean you know from the very first variant to the Delta variant which you know was very lethal to this latest Omicron and its sub variants it's almost like dealing with different diseases and mm. and it's one of those viruses that has left us so humbled because it has receptors on so many different cells it's not just the lungs, it's not just the blood vessels, the brain, the heart, you know, all sorts of organs that it can potentially infect and live within and cause changes in. And, and we're gonna continue, I think, not just today or this year, but for the next several decades, I think, to really try to mm. understand the pathophysiology of COVID, how it's affected our thinking, how it's affected our, our brain size. We've seen brain atrophy or shrinkage for Yikes. people that have had COVID. So I call anyone who's had COVID a COVID survivor. And I think that the medical textbooks from now on are really going to be looking at a lot of these COVID survivors and really helping us inform future decisions and, and learning about new treatments, as you said. I was gonna end it there, but 
brains are shrinking as a result of COVID? Yes, yeah, so we've seen data that you have brain, you can have brain atrophy after a COVID infection. So the size of the brain could potentially actually also be smaller. So it's again, terrifying. so much that we're learning, but at the same time, I feel like it's really helping us to empower ourselves and each other to find therapies to reverse some of this because it doesn't mean we have to accept it for what it is. It just means we need to look harder to try to make things better and kind of recover from everything that's happened to us. This is fascinating insight. So Dr. Pyle Coley, we really appreciate a few minutes of your time and lending us your expertise and a bit more about some of those treatments for long COVID. So thanks again. Yeah.